Hello and welcome to One on One. I am Cyril Stover. My guest is a Catholic priest, a professor of ethics and intercultural studies. He is director of Catholic Institute for Development, Peace and Justice and is a board member of the Godfrey Okoye University, Inugu. Let's welcome Reverend Monsignor Obiora Ike. You're welcome. Thank you, Cyril. Well, Monsignor Obiora Ike comes with a very interesting background and I must say, an amazing childhood history. He is Igbo by heritage, but was born in Guso, which is now the capital of Zamfara State. His parents, both natives of Eziago in Enugu, were living in Guso, where his father worked as a manager with the British company GB Olivant. He started school quite early, at the age of five, in Gombe. And from then on, Monsignor Obioraike has gone from one academic pursuit to another across the globe. From the Bigad Memorial Seminary in Ugu, where he earned a BA degree in philosophy, to Leopold Franzes University, Innsbruck in Austria, University of Bonn, Germany, University of London, England, University of Paris, France, Monsignor Bioraike acquired sterling academic laurels. The list is long Doctor of Theology, Master's degrees in Philosophy, Theology, Diploma in Journalism, Certificates in Economics, International Studies, French, Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. As a priest, he became the youngest in Inugu Diocese to be appointed Vicar General at 42. Now, there's so much about my guest. But well, let's just add that he's fluent in Hausa, Igbo, English, German, French, Latin, Greek, Hebrew, and Arabic. Professor Biraiki, welcome once again. Thank you. I might just add too that he is uh, the parish priest of St. Leo Parish of Enugu Diocese. Correct. And uh, to cap it all, he's just been, well, he's, he's a, he's a, a member of the European Academy of Science and Arts and the very first African to receive uh, the Heinrich Pesch Prize in Germany for social ethics and action. There's so much more about you and we're hoping that as we go on we'll begin to see other aspects of you as a priest and uh, there's so many things that you've done. But let's go back to the early stages. I can understand quite a number of the languages that uh, uh, you associated with Latin, Hebrew. Yes, I can understand that because of uh, uh, the relationship and the impact on your calling as a priest, Christianity. I can understand those. Hausa, yes, you were born in Goso in northern Nigeria. And so uh, it would be assumed that at that early stage you'd learn the language. But it goes beyond that. And there's Arabic. And so I'm wondering. How come this uh, young Igbo boy got interested in learning Arabic from a Christian background? It's very simple. If you live in the north of Nigeria and you grow under the Samiya tree, in those times in Gombe or in Nguru or in Kano or in such areas, you had the Malam under the tree who taught you the Quran. So, and the Quran is read and spoken in Arabic. So you start reading the Alhamdulillahi and so on, you know, and then you start writing it also. And because you have friends with whom you grew up, uh, you know, from that area, um, much of the language and interaction comes just with it. Yes. And also because Hausa language is a commercial language that has a lot of Arabic in it and things of other languages of the locals, you will discover that languages due to commercial communication already interface each other mm. and they meet. Okay. Ah. But at an early stage, you also knew something inside of you said, um, I want to become a priest. I agree. Faith makes all things possible. As a young man, you have a calling. We call it with the word vocation. And people have a passion for something. They may use the word. But as a young boy already far, three years, four years, when consciousness was clear, we are ten children, five boys and five girls on one family. And our father was a jolly good fellow. So he would always come back from home, from work, and gather all the children who were born then, put music, we dance, and we enjoy. And he said, what do you want to be when you are grown up? What do you want to be when you are grown up? And I'd always seen these white missionaries who lived and worked with us. I remember Father Fortune. I remember Reverend Carol in Gombe, Father Fortune in Nunguru. And they dazzled young people. They played football with the youth 
And um, it was clear to me that that was my calling. So far back when they asked me, what do you want to be? I always said I wanted to be a reverend father. And your parents supported that? Because they come from a liberal background, yes. They were open to people's destinies, yes. And I would encourage parents to allow their children to be what God wants them to be. So they encouraged me, my father especially, more so in a culture where I come from, where the first son must be the, the name carrier of the family, the legacy of the family. Because a reverend father does not marry, does not have children, does not have property, must give himself up to a universal and a higher calling beyond his shores. But my father said, go, if that's what God wants you to do. And there was nothing else I wanted to be but to be a priest. All right. So you did go on to be a priest. You went to the seminary. But then it wasn't just all about being a priest. You have this thing about um, pursuing knowledge, academic laurels. And uh, from reading from what we just said, easily through at least seven institutions of higher learning. What was the driving force for all this? Well, it's opportunity. It's not a right. It's a privilege. But besides this privilege, there is this quest you think about the scholastics who say fides querens intellectum faith seeking understanding because what we believe we cannot prove we do not know who has ever seen god who knows how god is it is a language of faith but that faith in belief which is a leap can be questioned from a rational point of view so the human being who believes who believes in god who believes in the substances of faith, and there are many articles of faith, can now sit back and say, can I justify this faith? And that is what you call the critique of pure reason. And then the critique of practical reason. And by so doing, you might then reach to knowledge, whether it is oikonomia, which is economy, or socialis, ordo socialis, which is society, or even politia, which is the politics of Greece in those days, and going through philosophy, which is the questioning of all things, questioning the origins of everything, something that is a universal category. Human beings have rationality. So the question, they ask questions. Children are very anxious. They want to know everything. Mommy, what is that? Daddy, what is that? So this inquiring mind is what all of us have received by nature. You structure it by opportunity, then you get into a knowledge environment. We are for those of us who read in seminaries, philosophers from Thales in Greek antiquity, through the sophists, through Socrates, through Plato and Aristotle, then you go even beyond them, enter into European sophistry and European philosophers, John Locke, David Hume, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, you reach Immanuel Kant and continue till Machiavelli, you jump them, and then of course you go into African philosophers. Right. And um, you think about great names like John and Beatty, and uh, we can mention a lot of names comes from e whichever culture. In our case, not many written, written um, traditions because we had an oral culture, but we found them in the wisdoms of our people. So all these help you generate a knowledge environment whereby philosophy is just one. Then start thinking about the natural sciences, then the humanities, and then the arts. I was lucky the bishop of Enugu, my bishop, sent me to live and study under the Jesuits. Now, the Jesuit fathers, uh, the Society of Jesus, which has um, a best um, name in education of the youth. Mm. And they told me, your mind is indefinite, it's not, it's not limited, unlimited mind. Therefore, pursue knowledge. They gave us a freedom, and it was free studies. We had scholarship okay. that exposed me. And so you took advantage of that, and you went on to it. Yeah. Well, I, uh, we describe you as a professor of ethics and... Uh, intercultural studies but tell me it might seem so obvious but it might not be really what we're thinking about what is ethics and intercultural studies well ethical is a greek word but the background of ethics is morals what they call in latin mores mores and the background of morality are values so values give room to morality morality is now distinguished from a morality that just says, women sit like this. This is how we always did it. Men do this. This is how we always did it. To a level of ethics, why? Why? Why must it be that way? Why ought I do this and not this? When a thinking mind 
descends now moral values and rationalizes them to say it is justifiable and it is right by sound reason and common sense that one should not tell a lie. Morality says don't tell a lie, no reason. The only reason is this is what we were taught from our family. But ethics will now justify, can I tell a lie? And it has reasons why I can tell a lie. To go safe, and it has also reasons why I should not tell a lie. Because I will not want myself to be lied to. And ethics then develops a rational level platform for debating values. Which are the foundations for, you might say, morality. But morality again is part of tradition. Handed over from group to group, from age to age. If they are not reflected, they become s s um, ossified. You just tell people, just do this. Like Jewish traditions, which in the Bible we saw Jesus criticizing. He told them, you hang on your traditions, but you don't look at the context and at the development and so on. There is, there is a debate in the New Testament which hermeneutics, translation and interpretation, helps us then to try to decipher. It happens also with our own interaction with our local cultures. You will see our young girls, um, they are told to move together, sexuality issues, honesty issues, integrity issues, punctuality issues, decency issues, and people will tell you in local villages, this is how we do it. Wake up early, go to work, go and so on. And they will define wisdoms around them. But it's not, when you ask a question, but why? Why shouldn't I wear a trouser as a girl? They'll say, shut up. Don't you know, you don't even ask that question. Mm. So the rationality behind ethics is therefore to do what we call moral reasoning. Okay. When morality engages reason, then you have an ethical background. Now, since you put it this way, we would come to um, our country, Nigeria, today. And uh, you would see that everywhere we look, there are issues of morality, there are issues of ethics. But some would tell you, it never used to be this way. And so the question is, is it that we lost something? Or is it that from what we understood about ethics and values, we didn't go beyond as to look deeper and find out the reason why those things held. What has happened in our society as well as world over is that we have moved away from what you might call closed societies. We now live in the open society. The closed society was within the village. It was only the villagers and the clans that lived there. They had their way of life. There was no intrusion from outside. It was like a blocked house and they made their things. All of a sudden, by virtue of historical contingencies in the last years, traditions are coming together. Cultures are coming together. Migrations are moving very fast. Technology has ingrained. And transportations, or you might call moving values and cultures from one culture to another and to another, has led to an intercultural attitude, display, transformations, formations, and linkages which question original points of departure. For example, marriage. For example, youth education. For example, behavior and manners, what we call civics. Hmm. So this interaction of persons are now moving the world together in a new language called globalization. And the means of modern communications exposes everything within seconds. It is only ethics that must now guide them because morality is no more enough. Morality is valued, valid only in that your context. But when you move in a larger level, your morality may not be the morality of the other. There is a crisis. Yeah, but then should this interaction necessarily produce negativity? The interaction produces critical people. And negativity is one side, but the other side of negativity is positivity. And it is this clash that's why we talk about even the clash of cultures, the clash of values, the clash of morality, the clash of peoples. That's why we have what the Marxists call the dialectics. It is a way of interpreting history that from a point of aggression, there is a counterforce which we call the antithesis. 
So there is a thesis, there's an antithesis, and in trying to solve them, you have now a synthesis, which becomes again another point of departure. So the Marxist communism will now look at world's history as a constant revolution. That's what you find in Hegel. But that's not another point of view. The Christian worldview will say, or the Muslim worldview will say, God has ordered entire nature according to an order. The sun rises in the morning, goes down in the evening, and if people followed nature and followed the way of life that has been ordered by the divina, the divine, lex divina, divine law, they will not have all the problems. But once human beings, for example, try to say, you know what? We have been told this in the past, we don't believe. We want now to re-engineer and retranslate society and bring in our own values. And we must also change because we are dynamic. Once they start doing that, then you find them saying, well, we don't need to appeal to God or to higher authority or even to the monarchs or to the autocrats or to authority. We now want to be people who make the laws for ourselves, democracy. Right. Fine, democracy and all that. But people would say to you today that um, societal values that are so cherished either no longer exist or they just exist in the name. Take, for instance, integrity. Values that exist and are founded on truth will remain values for all people and at all times. For the simple reason that truth is something which stands and withstands. And it can be maligned, it can be thrown off, you can go behind it, but it stands. So that when people come and say, for convenience sake, we don't want this value to stay again, just like stealing. Is stealing corruption or not? Somebody will say, you know what? Um, let's say that stealing is stealing, it's not corruption. Corruption should be some other thing when you just give bribe. So people look for arguments to overgo, undergo, underscore, go beside, only to live a selfish worldview. So values that are values must stay. There is a value in values. There is a reason for values. And because punctuality, respect, integrity, which is integral, which is being consistent, which is being principled, which is being valuable, which is see me as I am, I'm finished in what you see, nothing else. And you talk about the other values of family, of community, of sharing, of love, of giving. These values will always remain values. But society comes now with technology. Mm. So you don't need to shake hands again. You only meet people virtually. And when you meet, they say, I don't, what, many things are now happening, especially advanced countries, that the human interaction is reducing and the technical interaction is increasing. So humanity is going away. But humanity is a value. That is therefore the challenge. And that's why we need to engage in intercultural dialogue as Africans to show that whereas some societies may think about their own values dying and try to replace them with new ones, we must retain a certain authenticity, originality in those values we find useful for our society and keep them and fight for them and even embed them in our laws. Today, Nigeria is faced with a challenge of corruption eating deep into virtually every aspect of national life. And this has also its bearings on governance. And people always ask, how or where did we lose it? Corruption, governance, all of them are part of the human condition. The human condition is one of disaster, generally. When you read the holy books, or you look at the histories of nations, it was always something like human beings wanting to assert themselves besides others. I, ish, strong, others may not exist. But live and let live as a value gives room for platform for all to exist. So corruption comes in therefore when that word leadership, the leader of a ship, a ship that goes on water, or the leader of a sheep. The, the animals we call goats and sheep. Because that's where the word comes from. Leading them. Leading the sheep, which needs craft, which means which needs skills. And leading the sheep, the goats, which needs empathy. So empathy and skill give room for good governance. We have now people who come with neither empathy, with neither 
scale that's being qualified and they sit in positions of governance. That's where you have the problems. A government, a governor, a leader must have those two elements. The ability, that's the knowledge, and then the, 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 the sole element to lead people. The corruption begins once they are absent, and then they institutionalize them. So we keep asking, it's the same society that throws up these people who become the leaders. So why would society throw up someone who lacks those qualities? If democracy is transparent, society may not throw up those people. Because what I found, and I did a study, we did a study in democracy and African democracy. We must not forget that what we call democracy is a model being borrowed. What we had in our villages are the elder system. We had gerontocracy. We had community systems. We had the villages run by the village people, and they knew who is who. If we wanted somebody for any post, we said, ah, the leader of the war, the leader of organizing, the person to be in charge of games, who will be our treasurer for our money, people knew whom to give it. But when you came in a larger anonymous community and just say, sometimes those who had money just bought the thing. It's happening worldwide. And it is called democracy. But this time, the, in the man with integrity who does not have the money, is not a member of the party, but is pushed besides there, cannot rise to take over the post. And people have just to vote for those who appear. So we are thinking seriously, and that was a conference we visited, held in Frankfurt um, some couple of years ago, discussing adaptable democracy for the African context. We cannot say America does it like this, Nigeria must do it like that. There must be a way for people to draw lines and to say, can we now look at our own methods of what is the scope for the elders? But there are acceptable universal norms, which you just need to be a member of society to know what is wrong, um, the basics, like not taking what belongs to the community, appropriating what belongs to all, yourself alone, like um, being sympathetic, showing empathy to your neighbor, or living in peace. These things are universal norms. Think about, th philosophy will tell you, are you born with a, 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 a vacuum, or are you born through an educational system that fills in the vacuum? There are two schools of thought. Right. So when you are born into society, somebody must teach you how to eat, how to dress up, how to speak, how to behave, and transmit values, transmit values to you with which you grew up. The things you have mentioned, empathy, um, being careful, being respectful, being honest, not taking what belongs to another. They may be natural, but the training and the education strengthen them and justify them for you. And then you also have a punishment if you break them, because there are rules. What do we have now? Children born into society, there is no father figure and no mother figure. They grow on the streets. Or even children born, there is a father and a mother who are busy, but the children are trained by their peers, or they are trained by modern means of communication, or they are trained by a house boy or house girl who does not have any interest except to get a monthly pay. So we are not transmitting the values we received, because that's part of the big problem, transgenerational value um, uh, um, uh, education whereby parents do not even train their children again. They hand them over to be trained for them. So they don't, you can't hand over values. You can, you can hand over even language. So these children go, they learn the technologies, they learn arithmetic, they learn English, but what of the content? The quality content which makes you who you are. This is why in our society, therefore, generally, you find a lot of people, but they don't know who they are because they have not been given who they are. They have not been given the values which their parents they received. And those parents have, may not even have received. And we are reaching generations, therefore, that is now almost like that's what's happening in Europe and in America and some other advanced societies, so-called technologically advanced societies. You are reaching an environment where you are not trained by value-driven society. You are trained by technology. How can you imagine children wake up in the morning, they put a television before you? and then put you on a basket which rolls up and down and you just zero your face on television and keep on watching children's films until parents come back. If you cry, what they use now to calm you down is to give you a play game. No language transmission, no knowledge about the things that matter, no empathy of carrying behind and in front, even of giving mama milk. 
So when those ones disappear, you become a zombie, a robot child, trained in a technological environment. And now somebody wants you to come and be a Democrat, be whatever it is that we are expected of our people. So there is something families must do. And we have to go back to families and to go back to original values and to encourage parents. But eventually, families must survive. They have to work. They have to earn. They have to run around. And the places, like you live in Lagos, to go from one place to another is too far. Then you hang on the road trying to earn money to train children and pay for their school fees. But there are no more because you have not given them anything. You've given them the coat, but you have not given them the identity. So if the family values have diminished and this translation is not there, what about the educational system? <laughs> that is even worse. That is worse, Cyril, and I can tell you really, we have reached a stage whereby the teachers who teach the others are not even taught. Whereby the policies which government makes, unfortunately, are not thought through. There are constant some assault of policies. There is no consistency. There are so much of private interests for gain, selfish interests, which drives policies. There are also all other things in terms of the corruption, which undermines the quality education we demand for. And yet, in a country like ours, we have so many good schools that transmit knowledge, and they exist in Nigeria. But they are not often the public schools. And those who make the public policies, they don't put their children in the public schools. They take their children to those private schools or abroad. And then they leave the masses to go to those public schools where they have brought down the standards of education. And education is about quality. Quality is about control. Control is about mechanisms. And we now have the bazaar we are talking about. The value bazaar in schools. The corruption that books are being printed and there is nobody reading. You only need to bribe. And then that the government officers and all the officials, even the media that must now be a whistleblower because they hear the news and they catch the information. They keep quiet, probably, or they don't say it, or they say it and nobody hears. So we have a very big challenge in our country to engage in what I consider an ethical revolution. It has to be done to salvage the nation. What we see outside are the, we might say, the periphery. The real thing is the human identity and the human quality. How can I change society when I am myself not a changed person? It's not about the coat. If I put off a black coat and put on a white coat, I've changed my coat. But who is wearing the coat? It is the same goat or the same pig. So we must go in to say, can we change ourselves and look inwards? It starts from the family. It starts from childhood. It starts from method. It starts from discipline. It is a matter of entire lifestyles that must be put in question. And we need to create ethics institutes in every institution within government, not just run by government, but run by such professionals that make it possible for ethical standards to be maintained. We, must, we have standards organizations of Nigeria and such standards. But ethics is something about the rational quality of human behavior. Because a human being is a moral agent. A moral agent is one who decides between right and wrong because that moral agent has freedom. My machines have no freedom. My goods have no freedom. A human being has freedom because the divine made it so. The freedom to say, I want. I don't want. I go right. I go left. All other organic, inorganic things in nature are just like that. But the human being is an organic living being with even a soul. For some who debate that, then we say with a rational faculty, right. with a thinking faculty. And here, exactly, we must challenge our governments to go and do a research. Now, you appoint people ministers or you appoint them commissioners. Who gives them training? Who gives them a retreat? For example, that they even know their job, past, present, and future. There must be a way of retraining the trainer. And this is where we come in, in the university to train those future Nigerians because the future lies within them. The future lies beyond them. But to train them in such a way that they now assume responsibility to question the society from where they came, moral reasoning, to establish and reframe the, the points of departure differently for their own time, and to equate. But when the institutions themselves, like the universities, 
are deficient, what are we giving up? As they say, you only give what you have. That is a big problem. You can only give out what you have. Here now, what I see in so many universities is the, is the person of the teacher himself who has still some value because the system seems to have collapsed. If systems don't function, you, then you depend only on the, quality, the human quality of those who still want to make things happen, the optimists. Many have given up. Many have checked out. We have so many of our professionals living abroad in functional societies. What we have agreed to develop in our own point of view by not fighting against what is right is to have a dysfunctional society. That's why the provisions are not made. That's why the infrastructure is not there. That is why the superstructure is not there. That's why the roads are not there. That's why petrol is lacking on the roads. That's because someone has decided to make the system not work. And to make a system work, they must work based on values. But to just say, I'm an authority, I just make this law, you make the law. But the law cannot operate itself. Every law has something to defend. Justice issues, human values, the dignity of human persons, whether it is of female or of male, property, which has to be protected, and the values. But then they make a law for private gain. People even write constitutions to protect themselves and arrogate all power to themselves as if a constitution was being written for one president. And they do not think beyond. And I'm thinking about Nigeria and other countries. Look at Burundi, where a constitution is changed overnight, or Burkina Faso. One wakes up, says, I'm in power now. Let me change the constitution for myself. Making himself God. Once people in authority forget that they are human, finite, limited, and the temptations to power are so many. That's why a great Alexander the Great will always wake up in the morning with the gong of his, his boy who says, Alexander, remember, you are human, you shall die. Alexander, remember, you are human, you shall die. And then he disappears. And it makes Alexander to be sober. And today it's called Alexander the Great. What made him great? He saw his limitation as a leader. He didn't arrogate all the power to himself. He believed that there is another tomorrow. He was humble. The same with Solomon and with many others. So we need to engage even our leaders. They need to engage those they manage with. But we can only give them the credible elements for a society which they know. But some don't want to take it because of corruption. Let's look at Nigeria today and uh, look at other aspects of our national life. We say we strive to bring back those values for which we were known as Africans and Nigerians. But along the line, we've lost. The education system has been deficient. But again, we do have what we fall to, or we appear to fall to these days. And we call it religion. And there are people who say, oh, Nigerians are very religious people. I hear you very clearly. But what our people call religion is actually our culture. The culture we come from is a natural culture. We believe on the soil. We live on the soil. It gives us all our food. So we respect the soil. We give the soil coal and not and palm oil and palm oil, palm wine and say, land, please give us. So we make sacrifices to the earth. We live on the mountains and plant our teas and so, so we also worship the mountains. We respect them because we are environmentally knowledgeable from antiquity, from our ancestors, who used what you might call their relationship to nature to create what today we call religion. But in reality, it was an economic model hmm. for survival. And because they put it into the hands of the divine whom they could not see, they had to settle. It was a settlement. It was a negotiation. <laughs> Let the rains fall, but I give you my fowl. And then because I've slaughtered the fowl, you'll give me the reins. And around that develop then, of course, the diviners who will do the work of praying and doing the things. And now a religion, because religion is a Latin word, religio, a relationship between the seen and the unseen. It's a bonding, but it's a level of faith. So for people like ours in Nigeria, <coughs> our culture, made we come from very rich cultures. I must admit that some people don't know their cultures again. Many of our people, you ask them, where do you come from? They will tell you where they come from originally. Many don't know where they come from. 
go to the United States. Where do you live? Uh, my father was born in Washington, but I live now. Well, where do you come from? I don't know what you mean by where you come from. I'm on the earth. I come from where I'm born. And if I move, they move homes. And once they move homes, they don't talk about, I'm a southerner, I'm a northerner. You are just there. In fact, a Nigerian woman who is pregnant leaves her country, lands in the U.S., delivers a baby. That baby is already an American citizen just for being born on the earth. And then becomes, um, carries the passport and has to defend the nation and become patriotic. Here we have a different culture. So religion coats itself with our culture. And we call them African traditional religions. We've moved from there when the missionaries came, um, whether it's the Muslim missionaries or the Christian missionaries or the Buddhist missionaries or whoever they came. And they built on our culture because we are people who receive. Right. Our cultures, we are not aggressive. Our cultures, we are recipient. Our cultures, we are open. And our cultures, we are simple. They received everything that came that was good. They thought deeply, definitely, but they didn't probably, they listened to, like when the missionaries came, they brought schools. They brought hospitals that cured the diseases for which we went to the diviner. And when, for example, I had elephantiasis in the past, but now I went to a missionary or a leprosy and I went to a missionary hospital, Christian missionary that cured my sickness, all of a sudden I began to believe in the new God of that missionary organization. Mm. And from there now our people find that a good relationship with the divine is very important. So our people are very, very, I think calling our people religious is trying to say that they believe in their dependence, which is a very positive quality. Godliness. Does it instill godliness? Because today we see the people who so badly run society. They are people we look at and say these are leaders. They are leaders in the churches. They are leaders in the mosques. And we pray at every given opportunity. If there's a natural disaster, we're praying. If we're going to play a football match, we're praying. If we're doing everything, if we're appointing people, we pray. If we buy a new car, we pray. But where is the godliness? Well, first of all, prayer is in itself something good, even if there is no godliness. But prayer is an act, is an action of belief, is a sign of dependence, is an acknowledgement. So to pray is step one. Step two is to live according to the prayers and according to the beliefs. That is step two. And then there will even be step three beyond which one will continue to move because virtue is like a ladder and you don't stop. So the act of prayer for which our people are known for is something we must encourage. There are societies that don't pray again just because they don't believe in anything. But if you don't believe in anything, you will die for nothing. So we believe in something and we die for something. That is already an act of principle. It is better to believe than not to believe. And people who believe dare because belief comes with courage. It's a leap beyond which you cannot see, but you believe because you trust. And that trust must be managed by, therefore, a religious organization to which you belong. Some people believe without belonging to any religious organization. But if you believe and believe in it and trust in a religious organization, you expect godliness and leadership quality. And when it falls, you, you start doubting. And that's where people leave their churches, leave their religious organizations, and start their own, or stop believing and become even atheists. So there is a burden a responsibility imposed on leaders of religions to practice what they teach. But those who belong to these religions, there are set out values in these religions. They don't live by them. They profess those religions, but they don't live by them. Nothing new, Cyril. Nothing new. We see today... Humanity has always been like that. We see today that the concentration is more towards prosperity and not towards um, any form of spiritual enrichment. And people say that uh, the only way you can acknowledge uh, having been blessed by the invisible one is by the number of houses, cars, and uh, all such worldly goods that you acquire. Unfortunately, but that is not religion. That is materialism. We must talk about the use of under religion. Yeah, we must talk about the use of religion and the abuse of religion. So what abusus, abusus, which is abuse does not remove uzus which is used. So a good religion lifts you up because it lifts up the spirit. And because we are human, made up of matter, the body, which you can touch, 
and spirit, the mind which you cannot touch, will try to live and satisfy the needs of those levels. Otherwise, you have a dysfunction. The balance between the material and the spiritual is so necessary. But tricksters, crooks, try also to use a spiritual arrondissement, a spiritual paraphernalia to sell their materialist tendencies. And in so doing, they hoodwink the simple who are already poor, who have nothing, and who are even looking for survival, who are sick and need health, who have no money at all, who have no jobs. Poverty is part of this dimension. Go to industrialized countries. They have a different type of religiosity, but also for those in need. That's why Karl Marx will even sometimes say religion is like opium for the people. Religion is not an opium. True religion gives you your formality, your identity, your integrity, and your personality. But a false religion will abuse, and that's what we have, that materialism is being preached. But it's not everybody doing that. So we need differentiation. Because there is this, and there is that. There is white, there is black. In there niche. is tall, there is short. We have to engage, and when it reaches a particular stage, like what happened in Lagos State, that they became too noisy for people who live on the streets, they made their law, do your microphone in your church, don't disturb others. And when, for example, people become aggressive with it, they say, no, religion is a fundamental right, but you don't need to disturb the liberty of others. So sometimes you may have regulations that guide and protect fundamental freedoms of which religion is one of it. And because religion is free, and there is a bazaar of choice, people also decide even to commit suicide. Don't forget. So you cannot tell somebody, don't go to this place, go to that place. What we have now is a competition. But definitely, traditional religions, whether it's in our African cultures, or in Christianity, or in Islam, you think about the Sunni and so on, they have some value. They are a little conservative. They are not rushing to prosperity. They still allow the will of God, inshallah, to have a space among in the human performance. The other ones command God. God, I ask you now because I believe in you to do this now. No. But people believe it. And what are you going to do with their beliefs? You have no right to regulate that one. We do hope that in the language of ethics, because ethics must engage religion also. In the, that's why we do intercultural, intercommunicative, international, global ethics. As long as we now have a platform where rationality, reason, becomes the guiding level for why must somebody give a kickback? Let's discuss it. To get a job, is it right? So if all others don't give a kickback, they will not get the job. So you are undermining a system. There must be transparency, even in religion. But the members must also ask for it. We are seeing, I belong to the Catholic Church, we are seeing a Holy Father, Pope Francis, who is demanding this of his own Christians. It's speaking to the bishops, to the cardinals, to the priests, to the laity. And he is coming also with a record of don't look at what I say, look at me. Because the best teaching sometimes is life. You'll find that in the life of Gandhi, find that in the life of Mandela, find that more especially in the life of Christ. Who say, as I have done, you do. Look at my example. So the best teaching is example. And that is why we talk about the theory of ethics and the practice of ethics. Values in action. Values in action indeed, but one of the biggest challenges, if not the biggest today in Nigeria, is that of terrorism, a reign of terror that is devastating one part of the country. There was a time if you asked any Nigerian, or if you told any Nigerian, that a day would come when somebody would blow themselves up to state any point, they would say, not a Nigerian. I don't I accept. Think. First of all, um, Cyril, I will have to differ. Far back in 1990, I had said and written down in my book, Church and Society in Dialogue, that when we don't guarantee basic securities, then we plant insecurity for the future. So our problem, or what you say, the greatest problem in Nigeria is terrorism. No, terrorism is just a product of something. Insecurity is a problem. And when you talk about insecurity, you talk about food security or food insecurity, social security or social insecurity. Once people are sick and they do not know where to go to get a cure, 
because you go to a doctor, you don't have a health insurance. In some other societies, you go to a doctor, you get treatment immediately, whether you have the money or not, because you pay into a functional secure system, whereby you are an identity, a citizen, and you are cared for. And if you are working, you are paying in something. Not just for yourself, but for every other person who is part of yes, So I think that security, okay. food security, job security, social security, economic security, political security, that is much more the challenge we have. Because okay. when there is poverty, what does someone lying on the ground need to do again? That's why they kill themselves. But and then buy into alienating ideologies like if you took a bomb and threw down terrorism, then you will be going to heaven or whatever it is. Or if you follow this lifestyle, because they are now being misled. But there, Enlarge the scope. But there are people who would say to you that, um, who would ask the question and say, does deprivation, mere deprivation, translate a human into a monster? Systematic deprivation translates a human into a super monster. The Second World War was fought because there was poverty in Germany. The First World War was fought because there was the ego. But take the Second World War that cost 110 million lives. Why was there a war? Because the Treaty of Versailles had made Germany, which was an industrial nation, to become an agricultural nation. There the, will always be poverty, really. There will always be poverty, but it's not systematic poverty. What we call systematic poverty is when a nation makes it impossible for people to advance. If I have the infrastructure, a government exists to provide for the common good. When a government does not provide for the common good, it has lost its legitimacy to be government. It were only containing it. And this is fact. And this is the theory, political theory in John Locke 400 years ago. So when a government does not provide roads, does not provide electricity, does not provide water, does not provide the basic things they have to do, the securities you need to be patriotic. If you tell me be patriotic, why? What have you done for me to be patriotic? You say you have to bring, like American president will say, do not ask for what your nation will do for you. Ask for what you will do for your nation. But what does the American government do for its people? Because I pay my tax, because I'm working, then they use the tax money to give me service. Here you don't have a job. Students come out of a university, don't have a job. But we know that Nigerians have money they have stacked abroad in overseas universities, or overseas banks. That 150 billion has been declared missing for the past 10 or more years by Nigerians who take them away. That cannot be a way to build a secure society. So those who have seen it happen start agitating. Far back in 1990, I saw agitation coming. I spoke about it. I wrote about it. I preached it in churches. And I urged for a social justice. I started an institute, the Catholic Institute for Development, Justice, Peace, and Caritas. It is thought and action, whereby we looked at what makes a society function. A society functions by give and take. Every human being has a desire to have a space. You cannot edge out somebody and create him into a complex. He becomes a complex person and becomes a trouble. And we have the land, we have the brains, we have the natural resources, we have the people, very importantly, and they are brainy. But a little tiny minority have hijacked the entire social, you might say social wealth, the common wealth. When you have a budget of a nation, I saw something in Lagos yesterday I couldn't believe, driving from um, downtown mainland and going then through the, another bridge. I saw pipes, Victoria Island just laid on the earth. And my driver, a simple driver, told me, those pipes have been paid for. But you see their dysfunction, they have collected the money and they have chopped it and they have not delivered. Another government will either condemn it or start all again. So you discover even the lack of control. So there is something wrong with the how we have managed our societies. Terrorism is the product, the symptom. When you are sick, you go to a doctor and say, what is the, what is the, so we see terrorism. What caused it? What caused it? It's poverty, lack of education, lack of access, lack of responsibility. Those on top, look at how our politicians drive their cars on the roads. We are the citizens, but they push us out to pass. And the soldiers who accompany them and the police who accompany them treat us as if we were nothing. You cannot do it in civilized societies. I am a national, a citizen, and you are there to protect me. Have you protected me? You push me out of the road, which my taxpayers' money for those of us who are working built. For what reason? 
and then they have abused it to such an extent that everybody then wants to run into the uh, point of the, to, to where the money comes from, whether it's in the oil business or in the other businesses, and then they take part of the political business, which is the biggest business. The biggest business is join a political party and steal money. Not that every politician is bad because we have so many good and great people in this nation. And we cannot run a society without politicians, good ones. But what we have is a system that allows thieves to go free. And when you catch the thieves by the lawmakers who catch the thieves, they give you some portion of the booty, then you take your own and compromise and you leave the thief to go. And it continues and has become a system. Why did Nzogu do a coup in 1966? Ten percent. People who take a contract and take 10 percent then. I don't know whether we're talking about 10 percent again. So you say we sowed the seeds of what we faced today a long time ago. Yeah. We sowed the seeds of what we faced today a long time ago. It's not that it's not curable. It's curable. Every society goes through what you might call its own turn. Nigeria is a great nation. 350 languages, 350 tribes, whatever you call it. Such a beautiful country. God's own country. We might even call it. But then we inherited from the British, the colonial masters, something we shouldn't have inherited, a dysfunctional state. They didn't build unity before they left. And they didn't leave because they wanted, they left in a hurry. Yeah, but was it their responsibility to build the unity for us? It was, was not it their, ours? it was not their responsibility to bring us together. They had no reason to leave their shores to come and rule, bring people so together. So what's wrong with us? What is wrong with us is that we have, or we must think about past, present, and future. The past is built on, um, on, fraud, on fraud. The fraud is that someone leaves his own shores to come and take what belongs to another in the name of beautiful name, colonialism, and we're bringing them civilization. But what you brought them was gather the people together, use 100 soldiers to rule them, and then hand over and run away because you were pushed out. If Nnam Diazikiwe, NCNC, and his group did not fight for nationalism and independence, the British would have been here. And if the Second World War did not take place, Nobody we're talking about. Um, uh, Nigeria would have been still under the British government. Over government. 50 years, we've had the opportunity to turn things around. No. If you plant a tree that is a bad mango tree, for the next 100 years, you'll still be giving you bad mango fruit. So what we have is just like the original sin which we teach in Catholic thought. The mere fact that Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, that has brought to humanity a fractured original sin that anybody born in Catholic teaching and catechism comes in with corruption, a certain proneness to evil. And it must now be fought by a redemption, why Christ had to come to liberate man. And having come and liberated man, we should now be looking not at the uh, state that we are for, but we must now be hoping for the future. And that's my hope, that Nigerians, especially the youth, and a new crop, a new image, a new religion, not just religion in the sense, but people within the religions, must start being critical enough to say, how can we go further? That's what NTA is doing. Sometimes I'm really happy that one-on-one -on -one provides an environment for us to share the knowledge, which must now reach. I am a teacher. I now go to the classroom, and my students can never be the same. It's like an ocean. Uh, there must be a difference made in the life of one fish. I cannot say, oh, my God, all these fish are being blown out of water, and they're not going back to the water again. They're dying out of water. I can take one fish... All right. Throw it back into the water and make a difference in the life of that fish. And that's the hope. Reverend Monsignor Biora Ike, Professor of Ethics and Intercultural Studies, it's been interesting talking to you. Thank we you. do hope we'll have this opportunity again to do this talk. Thank you. We well, thank you for coming. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, that's the way it's been on this edition of the program. We'll reach you again next week on One on One. I am Cyril Stover. Bye for now.